The detailed description seems almost unmistakable today. The sky departing in a flash, fire and smoke rolling back up into the void and forming pillars of smoke that spread throughout the stratosphere, darkening the sun, moon, and stars. Nuclear war begins as the sixth seal is stripped from the scroll in the sixth chapter of the Revelation. If we follow this interpretation to its logical conclusion, the blowing of the first six trumpets detailed the devastation of thermal nuclear war and its aftermath. Like the fabled phoenix festooning the UN Security Council chambers, the fatally flawed New World Order arises from the ashes. In past generations, inventive interpretations were postulated by those who had never lived to see the time of their fulfillment, and those outdated expectations passed on to their offspring. 21st century war machines, depicted in the fifth and sixth trumpets, were thought to be monsters that were specially created to inflict the wrath of God on the inhabitants of the earth, but God's wrath is not poured out until after the seventh, the last trumpet, gathers the faithful to the sea of fire and glass. In reality, it is mankind that has created armor-plated flying locusts, iron horses that spew fire and smoke and brimstone, and other mechanical monsters of modern warfare. They have done so in their headlong pursuit of global dominion, or in righteous defense against maniacal tyrants who attempt to establish their version of utopia. The interpretation I lay before you, I did not inherit, nor did I choose, but rather I was chosen for this interpretation. The upcoming war for which the world is preparing was shown nearly 2,500 years ago to the prophet Zechariah and nearly 2,000 years ago to John on the Isle of Patmos. Both men were taken into the future, to the day of the Lord. Until recently, it has been impossible to understand Zechariah's puzzling prophecy because an errant vowel point was added to the scroll of Zechariah nearly a thousand years after it was recorded by the temple scribes. That one simple vowel point distorted the text beyond all recognition. Compounding the problem, the correct interpretation of the book of the Revelation is dependent upon an accurate understanding of the prophecy of Zechariah. There are prophecies that were sealed until the time of the end. This is one of them. I arrived in Iceland with a lump in my throat. 36 hours earlier, I was in Costa Rica having dinner with friends when I confessed that I knew in my spirit that I had to do something immediately, but I had no idea what it was. My friend looked me in the eye and said, you need to go to Iceland. That's it, I need to go to Iceland. Until those words came out of my mouth, I had never even thought about going to Iceland, ever. I was sitting in a tropical paradise wearing sandals. He said, I will take care of your flight and your lodging, get packed. In the early morning hours of September 11, 2001, two strangers picked me up at the airport with orders to transport me to Inge's bed and breakfast in the outskirts of Reykjavik. Unloading my bags outside the inn, I paused in the morning darkness and asked the two men if they would pray with me. I confessed that I had no idea why I was there, but I knew that Iceland was where I was supposed to be. As we prayed, I heard a clear, quiet voice say, go to sleep. When you wake up, you will know why you're here. The innkeeper led me to my room. After 36 sleepless hours in transit, I immediately passed out. The next thing I heard was a fist slamming on the door. Inge flung the door open and shouted, something terrible has just happened in America. I sat up with a sigh of relief. That is what I was waiting for. Without a word, he led me to the television room just in time to watch the second plane hit the World Trade Centers. As the buildings burned and the smoke filled the New York sky, I imagined this scene happening in every city across America. Within the hour, I was broadcasting from the Reykjavik Christian radio station. Two hours later, I was on national television. For several hours that day and for the duration of the week, I delivered my unrehearsed message to the nation of Iceland. 
the upcoming war against Israel will commence the day of the Lord and initiate the intermediate fulfillment of the fall feast of the Lord. It will result in the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant and at that time the Messiah will confirm the covenant to begin the last seven years of the age. It is time to get ready. The brimstone is about to hit the fan. At the end of the week, the National Maritime Museum was packed, standing room only, as I detailed the confession of Shlomo Goren, the chief rabbi of the State of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was never lost. It was deliberately hidden in the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. Rabbi Gorn was not speaking from Jewish tradition. He stated emphatically that he had seen the Ark with his own eyes. That day, I corrected the invented notion that the confirmation of the covenant spoken by the angel to Daniel has anything to do with an antichrist land deal with Israel. I clarified that it is the Messiah who will confirm the covenant that was ratified when his blood anointed the most holy, the Ark of the Covenant. I spent hours detailing the hiding of the Ark by Jeremiah during the siege of Nebuzaradan what happened to the Ark of the Covenant on the day of Yeshua's crucifixion, and Jeremiah and John's prophecies concerning the revealing of the Ark in the last days. At the end of my lecture, a woman stood up in the crowd and spoke words that sent a shiver of lightning through my body. I thought you would tell us the relationship between the pillars of brass in Solomon's temple and the World Trade Center buildings. I grabbed the podium to steady myself. I didn't know that I was going to tell you anything of the sort, but there is something there. I just don't know what it is, it is, it is. yet, yet. You know, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Cut! There are hundreds of hours spent behind the scenes on writing, filming, editing, on makeup and lighting. Open one, take one. Every episode of the Chronological Gospels reaches across the globe with the true gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua, Jesus, taught. This is the greatest story never told, a story that is changing lives around the globe. The Chronological Gospels is being watched on several continents every day of the week, but none of this happens without the financial support of our executive producers. This is your opportunity to leave a legacy that will change eternity for countless people around the world. Please, become an executive producer of the Chronological Gospels. Revelation. I arrived in Israel two days before the Feast of Tabernacles just two weeks after the implosion of the World Trade Centers. Jerusalem was bustling with people who had come from around the world to join in the festivities. Haim, my producer, arrived a day before and purchased lumber, sackcloth, and palm fronds with which to construct the sukkah, the tabernacle in which we would be living for the next week. Day after day, Jewish and Gentile believers gathered in our sukkah to discuss the prophetic scriptures and the events of the past two weeks. Just before sunset on Friday, which ended the Feast of Tabernacles, I moved up to my room. I printed out the book of Zechariah from my computer and began my Sabbath study in solitude. I lay in bed with the words of Zechariah in my hands and recalled how this prophecy was recorded by the temple scribes just a few hundred meters away, more than two millennia ago. I drifted off to sleep and awoke the next morning with the papers on my chest and my pen still in hand. I continued reading the words of Zechariah. I looked up and I saw a flying scroll. The angel asked, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. The length is about 20 cubits and the circumference is about 10 cubits. Now, knowing that the divine biblical cubit is 20.62 imperial inches, I calculated this flying scroll to be about 35 feet long and about five and a half feet in diameter. The angel said, this is the curse that flies over the face of the whole earth. Everyone that steals shall be cut off, killed by it, 
and every one that swears shall be killed by it. And I, Yehovah, Sevaot, will bring this forth. It will destroy the abode of those who steal my words one from another. They repeat each other's words, cite each other as a source of their authority, tell each other how great they are, and then pretend that their message came from the Lord. It will destroy the abode of those who swear falsely in my name. They say the Lord says this and the Lord says that and the Lord told them to tell you that you have to do such and such. Those who claim to represent the Lord but are doing so under false pretenses, this flying container will kill them also. It will incinerate both wood and stone and leave a deadly residue. Then the angel said, look up and I will tell you what this is. Okay, what is it? This flying container is what they look like all over the earth. Then I saw a weight of lead and a woman that sits in the midst of the container. Then I saw what Zachariah saw in his vision. I immediately sat bolt upright on the side of my bed and shouted out, this is not a woman, this is a fire. This is not a woman, this is a fire. What I saw and what I shouted, I could not deny. I quickly scribbled out the notes that I was making and went down to the sukkah where Haim Goldman, Joshua Cohen, and David Rodstein were studying the scriptures together. All three Jewish believers in Yeshua, all three raised from their youth in the Hebrew scriptures. I want you to listen to this scripture and tell me what you see. When I come to the word woman, I am going to say the word fire. David, a lawyer, immediately objected. You cannot just change a word, what does it say in Hebrew? He opened his Hebrew Bible and I stopped him. I don't know what it is in Hebrew. I am reading King James English, just listen. Just listen. Their remonstrations finally ceased and I read the passage. They were stunned. They saw it. Haim cautiously proceeded. Okay, we see it, but what does it say in Hebrew? David flipped the pages of his Bible, skimmed down to verse five. Asha, Asha, it is a fire. It is literally a fire offering. David reminded us that he was currently enrolled at the Orthodox Yeshiva in Jerusalem, Eish HaTorah, the fire of the Torah. At that moment, I knew that this was revelation from heaven. There was no way that I could have come to that conclusion by just reading the English version of the Bible. In fact, every translation in every language on earth renders this as an evil woman in a flying basket because a vowel was added to the text that caused everyone to pronounce the word as Isha, woman, rather than Asha, fire. I saw a talent, literally a key car, a sphere of lead, and a fire, not a woman, but a fire, was placed in the midst of the flying container. The container that was 35 feet long and five and a half feet in diameter. In verse six, the angel said that these flying containers look similar all over the earth, though their volumetric values vary vastly. Verse eight, the angel said, this, this fire is evil. This is an evil fire offering. And he put the fire in the midst of the flying container and put the lead in the opening of the container. This, my friends, is the exact composition and construction of a thermal nuclear warhead and the precise dimensions of a Scud missile. These devastating devices will be used against the land of Israel. But by whom? When? The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind the scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when he did it, and why. The timing of it all means everything. And now, 
The Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type, and every page appears exactly the same as the original, so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels larger print edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus, the larger print edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book, measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Order now and you'll also get two bonus CDs of Michael Rood's audio reading of the introduction section to the Chronological Gospels. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is nine by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version and I can just stand back and I can teach from it and it's just, it's the perfect size. Order the Chronological Gospels larger print edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original and the bonus audio CDs of the introduction, read by Michael Rood. Get the Chronological Gospels Bible larger print edition for just $69.95. Call or visit our website now. There were no vowels in the original scroll of Zechariah. And at the time that they were added, no one could have imagined that a flying cylindrical container, 35 feet long, five and a half feet in diameter, with an evil fire offering encased in lead, would kill people, destroy entire buildings, including the wood and the stone, and leave behind a deadly residue. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers launched a wood and cloth vehicle into the sky at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. At the time, no one could have imagined that just 66 years later, on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong would step onto the moon. To a scribe in the sixth century, perhaps an evil woman in a flying basket with a lead lid made more sense than it does today. But today, nuclear warheads and Scud missiles are a part of everyday life in Israel. There are more than 60,000 missiles aimed at Israel at this very moment. Unlike the scribes that transcribed Zechariah's prophetic vision, I have personal experience with nuclear warheads. In 1973, my job in the United States Marine Corps was to guard nukes at the compound at Naval Air Station, Cecil Field, Florida, and to escort convoys of nuclear warheads to the airfield. We stood guard, locked and loaded, in full battle gear as the nukes were secured to the weapons pylons of jets and transported to aircraft carriers out in the Atlantic Ocean. The base has since been decommissioned and my job declassified. I'm now free to speak about the things that I did and expound upon the things that Zachariah saw in his vision. Then I looked up and there came out two fires. The wind was under their wings, and they had wings like a stork. And they, the two fires, lifted up the container from the earth into the heavens. For more than a decade, I lived on the western heights of the Great Rift Valley, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, the lowest freshwater lake on the planet. This 3,000-mile rift in the Earth's crust is the migratory path of the magnificent white stork. Zachariah and I watched these giant birds migrate year after year. With the gentle flap of the wing to get airborne, the stork catches warm air currents and soars in circles on its motionless wings until disappearing out of sight. A flying cylinder with wings like a stork being lifted from the earth by two fires is something that I watched countless times. The moment the jet left the tarmac with that evil fire encased in lead, the Marine's job was done. Then I asked the angel, where are they taking this container with the evil fire encased in lead? He said, to a place built for it in the land of Shinar. 
There it will be established and set upon its own base. The land of Shinar is now populated by those who have vowed to destroy the nation of Israel. Zechariah, Joel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel were told nearly 2,500 years ago that the intervention of the Almighty would be the only thing to save Israel from complete annihilation in the last days. I left the sukkah and my friends in a somber mood that afternoon. I went back up to my room, got down on my knees and prayed. What is the sign that these things are about to come to pass? A clear, quiet voice whispered, keep reading. Since there are no chapters, verses, or punctuation in the original text, in either Hebrew or Greek, the best advice is to disregard the added apparatus and keep reading. Chapter six begins with the conjunction and. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass. Chariots are war machines. They are not commercial vehicles or private transportation. They are ancient tanks. The Hebrew word for both tank and chariot is Merkava. These chariots, these war machines, are coming out from between two mountains. But these are not natural geologic formations. These are mountains of brass, and brass is a man-made alloy. These war chariots come out from between two man-made brass mountains. This was the answer to the question raised in Iceland. This is the prophetic connection between the two pillars of brass in Solomon's temple and the two mountains of brass in New York City. The implosion of the World Trade Centers is the long fuse that will ignite Zechariah's thermonuclear war. King Solomon hired Hiram of Tyre to cast two enormous pillars of brass, 31 feet tall and six and a half feet in diameter. On top of each pillar was a solid brass capital that was five cubits, eight and a half feet tall, and again, six and a half feet in diameter. These imposing brass megaliths stood in front of Solomon's temple with no apparent purpose other than ornamental. 500 years after the temple was completed, Nebuzaradan, the commander of Babylon's army, conquered the city of Jerusalem and carried away all that was left of the population of Judea and all that could be found of the temple treasures. But after the siege, the height of the capitals was documented as three cubits, not five. What happened to 41.25 inches of solid brass sitting on top of hollow 31-foot pillars? That is the great secret of Solomon's temple. The pillars were designed to operate a sand hydraulic elevator system to hide the Ark of the Covenant in the event of siege. Those two capitals descended into the hollow, sand-filled columns operating a reverse lever system that allowed all the gold vessels to be secreted out of the Holy of Holies. Jeremiah was instructed in a revelation dream to transport the gold down through the subterranean tunnels and secure the ark in a stone vault prepared by Solomon 500 years earlier. 2,500 years ago, Zechariah saw a vision of the World Trade Centers once the two largest man-made mountains in the world. The sun reflecting off their tinted windows made them appear as brass. The day that the two mountains of brass imploded, the four Merkavim, four war chariots, were released from between the smoldering ruins of the World Trade Centers. The next day, headlines across the nation read, America at War. World War III had begun the United States of America launched its attack against ancient Babylon. In Solomon's temple, the descent of the brass capitals opened the subterranean tunnel in which the priest hid the Ark of the Covenant and the gold vessels of the temple. In New York City, the implosion of the man-made mountains of brass 
likewise necessitated hundreds of millions of dollars in gold to be moved from the underground vaults of the World Trade Centers and transported through a subterranean tunnel to a secret location. The implosion of the two brass mountains in New York forewarned of a financial collapse and commenced the war that will eventually bring all nations against Israel. In the end, that war will require the intervention of the Almighty and will result in the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant, the anxiously anticipated confirmation of the covenant on Yom Kippur, and the return of all Israel from their 2,000-year exile. The Feast of the Lord are prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. The feast are the mechanism whereby the Almighty tells us the end of time from the very beginning. The feasts are his appointed times. In the day that it is acceptable to him, the fall feast of the Lord will commence their intermediate fulfillment. The great war will begin its crescendo on Tishri 1, the day of trumpets, when the seventh new moon of the year is sighted. The Almighty will crush Israel's foes on Tishri 10, the Day of Atonement, and that is the only acceptable day for the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant. The Temple Mount will be cleared of debris, and on Tishri 15, the Feast of Tabernacles will commence. On Tishri 22, the last great day, Hashanah Rabbah, the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, spoken by the prophets Hosea, Joel, and James, will be poured out upon those gathered on the Temple Mount in obedience to the commandment and in response to Yeshua's prophetic instructions. I hope to see you there when the initial smoke clears. Mexico, uh, the is now going to 